Okay, so let's talk a little bit about this graphic that came from sciencedirect.com. Um, you can visit their website to learn more um, about this. Um, so what you're seeing is obviously the bubble diagram on the left. And that you see how those bubble diagrams are just sort of laid out randomly. And that's the thing I don't do. Because um, while well, they were fine to translate that into the floor plan on that it comes next, um, I find it's harder to make that happen, make that leap in the beginning, if you're not already working on some sort of grid and using some sense of scale. So while what they're doing works, um, I just find that if you spend a little bit more time in the beginning making the bubbles a little more to scale and working on a grid, it makes it easier to go from A to B. And so I, I just want to cover quickly that um, this is the goal, right? So we go from A to B to C to D to E to F. We're, we're, we're taking these bubbles and we're using them in the beginning to take a very rough look at um, space layout. How are these rooms connected to each other? Um, how are we laying out this floor plan? And by doing bubbles in the beginning, it keeps us very loose. And it also gives us the opportunity to try a whole lot of different arrangements before we spent, start spending a lot of time committing to, to drawing this and building this. And so you can see from A to B, it went from the bubbles, the layout of the bubbles, to they became squares, rectangles, uh, shapes, right? So they became rooms. So we went from bubbles to rooms. And you see they used color just like I use color. And they, used, they translated the color over from A to B. When you are working with a client, bubble diagrams will make zero sense to them. And I have learned not to show bubble diagrams to clients. That what you're going to do, the bubble diagramming is for you. For you to play around and come up with 20, 30 different options until you've figured out what's the best three. And then you want to take those best three and turn them into more something that looks a little bit more like B. Um, now, one of the problems with B, if you show that to a client um, without any furniture in it, is they will not understand scale. So it might behoove you to throw some furniture in there for sense of scale. Um, because at this point, when you go from A to B, you're going to really start digging into graphic standards and finding out how big should that kitchen be. You should have that information. Where are the counters going to be? That should be part of your schematic development. Where am I putting the counters? Where am I putting the appliances? Where, how big does a, does a uh, kitchen table need to be if I'm going to put one in here? How big is an island if I'm going to do an island, if I'm going to have some benches? You want to work through all that. Um, you want to establish all that when you're laying out that room size. Here they haven't done that. They may have done it. They're just not showing it. In fact, you can see in the end, it works out beautifully, but it wouldn't have worked out beautifully if they hadn't already de determined all that. So go ahead and lay that out. Go ahead and show that because that is the con conversation you're going to want to have with your client. You're going to want to work out maybe three of these. Um, and here's why. If you go to a client and say, here's your floor plan, here's your design, think about if you, if I was doing work for you and I came to you and I said, okay, here's your plan. What's, what is going to be your reaction? You're going to be like, well, how do you know this is my plan? What else did you consider? So in order to avoid your, your client from being, having that reaction, um, you want to, you want to produce about three of these. You don't want to, maybe four depends. Um, you can have more if you want in your back pocket. But I would, I would pull out three. This is how I used to present to clients. I would put up all three and I would show them these are some of the, these are the better options. I considered, you know, 30 different options and I narrowed it down um, to three based on our conversations and, and information I'd gotten from you. I feel like these are the three best designs. 
and the one that I recommend is this one. So you want to have one that you think is the best. Now, if they don't agree with you, you have two others that they might prefer. And they should be diverse enough from each other so that if they don't like one and the other two are just a really close second knockoff to that, you will have something different, right? You'll have something else. You'll have something that that is diverse enough from yours to for them to be able to look at something else and say okay that is something very that is something else different now um it doesn't mean that so you, you know you have three that you can present and they can pick the one they like the best it doesn't mean that that's necessarily going to happen sometimes they don't like any of them and they want to make mo or they they generally what happens is they like one but they want modifications and so one of my recommendations is when you're figuring out your fee to allow for one or two alterations, um, modifications to the plan. So you present these three to them and then they have, they make changes and you're gonna then go in and make those changes and resubmit that to them. After they have seen the, mod the pl new plan with the modifications, you're gonna want them to sign off on it before you do any more work. And here's why, <laughs> clients, sometimes we'll forget what they approved and you know it's just human memory it's not that they're trying to be this way it's just the human brain is not as good with visual memory as we think or memory as we think we are and so we remember things differently so by having them sign off on it and approving it you can do multiple things you can then bill them for work that has been done to date so you can start getting paid from the project because sometimes you get that far and the project doesn't go any further. Either the funding fell through or they didn't get the land they wanted, so you gotta start over, or who knows, they decided to get a divorce. Um, things happen. Um, and I, I would say that out of every, for every 10 projects I ever started, four to five ever got built, and I was working with Construct. I was working mostly with commercial clients who who already had their funding before they approached us. Um, so this is going to happen that you're going to do work for people and it's not going to get past the schematic phase, which is why you want to once you get to this point and they have chosen the schematic design that they like, you then want to be able to have them sign off on it. Now, um, one other thing. You really want something that looks like B with color, but it should be more like E in terms of having doors and windows, as well as, well, F. F is closer to what you would ideally hybrid between F and B is what you'd want to present to a client. You don't have to quite put in an extreme amount of detail, but you do want, they're going to want to know where's the closet, where's the door, how do I... Um, where's my water heater? You know, how do I get from this room to that room? You're, you're going to want that in your schematic, right? So the F is a, is a, it should be a colored F. And so that's kind of what you're shooting for to get to the end of the schematic phase. And also what you're going to be working through in this class. So back to the bubble diagrams. So once you have your bubble diagrams, turn them into rooms lay them out on that grid using rooms and you may have to make some adjustments you may have something that sticks out a little bump somewhere that's a little too small of a bump so you might have to shrink and squeeze your rooms so that's going to be the next phase you're going to massage your bubbles into rooms and then once you get those rooms laid out um, using graphic standards to determine how big they should be you're then going to want to also add in your doors and your windows room names um, usually also in schematic we will not um, do dimensions but we will say for example bathroom five feet by eight feet so that it helps you know the clients understand a little um, how big the rooms are okay um, so that's that's the process that we're going through that's where we're gonna that's where we're going to, going to get to and by the end of this process when you've done your floor plan for this you're going to want something that looks more like f that is going to be closer to your schematic work
but this is the stages you go through to get there.